Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest Monaco webinar, Forge Your Future. I'm Patrick Byrne, Senior Executive of People and Culture at Monaco. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all this afternoon. As a successful management consultancy firm, Monaco works tirelessly to equip and prepare our clients for a successful future. We also know that we need to make sure that we, as people, equip and prepare ourselves um, to be successful. So as part of this ambition, we started the Monaco webinar series, where we can talk to and we can learn from some of the greatest minds from around the world. And um, before I introduce our speaker this evening, um, I just want to let you know some house uh, kind of rules. We will be having a Q&A at the end, so please, you're more than welcome to post any questions in the chat and um, post anything in there that you want to um, ask our guest speaker tonight. And um, what I'll be doing is I'll introduce now uh, our guest speaker and then hand it over to him and then we'll come back at the end to do a Q&A. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce another one of the greatest minds and a great guy this afternoon, our guest speaker, John Sanai. John makes sense of future trends. He merges them so individuals and organizations can forge forward with confidence and whilst elevating their people and their leadership visual, their vision to exponential heights. You know, John's traveled virtually, locally, internationally. I've seen many of his videos on YouTube. He's received global recognition for his keynote talks, many master classes, and he's, he's an author of four bestsellers, and he's currently working on his fifth book. So well done, John. Uh, and he's fulfilled that goal of, you know, having um, successfully researched many future trends over the last while. When he's not speaking, a little bit about him, he's training for triathlons. Fair play to you, John. And he's convinced some family and friends to adopt abandoned dogs. So what a great guy. John, it's my great pleasure in having you on the Monaco webinars tonight. And I'll hand it over to you to take the floor. Hey. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you for the warm welcome. And it's been a wonderful journey just preparing for this uh, webinar with all of you. I'm going to share my screen so we can get stuck straight in. Um, let me get going with that. Right, man. Good afternoon, everybody. Wonderful to be with you today. As mentioned, my name is John Sane. I am fascinated with human psychology and the future, really preparing our mindsets, our heart sets, and our skill sets for what is coming. Today's talk is called Forge Your Future. It's really the idea about the responsibility each one of us have to be able to take on new information, seek discomfort, and look for things that are challenging for us. I will explain to you cycles today, the cycles that we are in, the seasons that we are going through as humanity. As you know, everything is cyclical. Even this crisis that we're in has been predicted and preempted by many sort of thought leaders and researchers. And I'll show you all of that today. I'll also go through the mindsets that we need to carry when we are given this much challenge, this much uncertainty, and talk about the latest research from neuroscience specialists at Stanford University, as well as a whole bunch of other things to give us at the end of this talk, hopefully, the impetus, the courage and the responsibility to take on this challenge of preparing for the unknown. And that's really where we are. The unknown is what we are moving towards. Right. So let's get stuck in because no matter how small or how big the transformation that we go through in our lives, there's always three stages to the transformation. Now, the first stage of all transformations is sad. Sad that we have to let go of the familiar, the comfort zones, the shore of familiarity is what we have to let go of in order to evolve, in order to become anew. But in this transformation, I can attest, and I'm sure you'll all agree, that it's been incredibly sad. Sad that we've lost many people, but also sad that we often have to let go of so many things that we've worked so hard for to start to recreate and to reinvent and recalibrate ourselves. And once we've gone through the process of sadness, what then we arrive at is the strange. Strange worlds are ahead of us because the new world doesn't look anything like the past world. And just over the last few months, the word NFT has been thrown around like it's almost always been with us. And all of a sudden, everybody's an NFT creator. We have got Bored Ape NFT being sold for $60 million, which is just a little digital picture of a Bored Ape. And think about that strangeness. And there is so much more strangeness to come. 
when the blockchain really kicks in and when AI really starts to develop, we are up for a really strange future. And what we need to do is become comfortable with the fact that we've gone through the sad and still are going through the sad. And now we'll start moving into the strange in many ways. We do have the third phase of a transformation, which is the adventure, but we're not quite there yet. And I think that's the key here is that we shouldn't be expecting an adventure just yet. We still have a lot of change to have happen at pretty much every touch point of our lives. And I'm going to take you through those and not to scare you in any way, but just to give you the perspective that this is what's going on. And we might as well become comfortable with it and adopt a mindset to become okay with challenge. And that's really the ultimate goal that we can have for this. Now, the society that we've been in for the longest time, in fact, for hundreds of years, has created a system that has got us, gotten us to become addicted to certainty. I mean, think about business modeling, think about education systems, think about the schooling system, think about even about marriage. It was always about bringing a certain level of certainty, security, and in fact, not even a certain level, a pretty much addicted to the absolute outcome of that certainty. And we always hear from all businesses, what's the ROI on that? Before I even invest in that, I must know what the outcome is. But here we are in a world where the future has never been so unknown. And there is really no certainty. And here we are trying to grapple as human beings into anchor points into the future. And the truth is, we, none of us have got anchor points into the future. I'm part of Singularity University in San Francisco, and I'm also an associate partner of Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies in, in Denmark. And both these bodies, who are incredibly smart at what they do in dive, sort of dissecting the future, both parties don't really know what the future looks like. And it's really so unknown that we first must realize, one, that we have been addicted to certainty, and two, we need to become okay with releasing certainty, to become okay with the unknown. And really, just even in our neuroscience, our brains, it hurts when we have to deal with uncertainty, when we have to deal with unpredictability, it's expensive. Our brain has to use a lot of energy. And you know, our brains want to make everything a habit and our brains love the fact that we have absolute outcomes. But the truth is we don't have that luxury today. And I'll show you the neuroscience research from Stanford that shows us that we need to shift our neuroscience to become actually okay with this level of uncertainty. But we must also bear in mind that because we've been addicted to certainty for so long, we are also very, very poor in our ability to reimagine. We've been so focused on efficiencies and certainties that we haven't taken the time to rethink and reimagine. UNESCO's Future Literacy Program, who I work with from Paris, they are building a curriculum for high schools to get high school children to understand how to categorize and contextualize the future as a skill set, something that was always really only for consultancies are now being taught in subjects in high schools. And what they call this mega trend is a poverty in reimagination. Human society is so sad and letting go of the familiar in the space of strangeness and panicking in it because we don't have those anchor points into the future that we aren't even spending the time, creating the time, or even getting together as groups of people to reimagine possible new futures. And so this is the real trick here is how do we actually become okay with uncertainty and then reimagine the possible futures. So this is the premise of what we wanna do in this talk. So let me start off with this first cycle that I explained to you at the beginning of the talk. Now, if we go back 300 years, 400, 500 years, we'll know that as human beings, what we were, were agricultural beings. And what was most important in agricultural times was our bodies, our brawn and our muscles, because what we had to do was work in the fields for 16 hours a day to feed our families and to hopefully have something left over to take to the market to trade. Now, for hundreds of years, this was taught from generation to generation to know the soil, the seasons, and to understand this process so that we could feed ourselves and survive. Most important thing was our brawn. But about 200 years ago, we start moving towards the Industrial Revolution. And what starts to happen here is that the factories, the machinery in the factories, start to replace our brawn, start to replace our muscles, our bodies. And we all know the story of the Luddites who want to go and break down factories and tractors and those things because they were still stuck in using their muscles and bodies and weren't happy that machines were taking over these tasks from them. But what started to happen when these factories started to take over 
these um, sort of tasks from us, what we had to start learning was left brain logic driven intelligence. And so we all went to school, we all studied this left brain process driven intelligence that we all are very high skilled in now because that's what our software was told to learn at school, university, et cetera, et cetera. But as we move into this new quantum world, we start to realize that this left brain intelligence, this logical thinking is being replaced by AI, by data and by machine learning. And because of this, we can't compete against that sort of linear type of intelligence. And so what we have to do is we have to evolve just like people did from agricultural times to industrial times using almost a different part of their brain. We have to now evolve and let go of the jobs that will be replaced by AI and by machine learning and data points and start to move into a space of intuition. Now, we often think of intuition as some fairy sort of lentil eating, sandal wearing hippie type of idea. But the truth is, Intuition can also be seen as flow. Flow can be seen as purpose. Purpose can be seen as excitement, as fascination. It's almost a right brain, heart led sort of process. Now, when we have a world where all these processes are driven by AI and robots and machines, what's left for us to do is a state of purpose, excitement, fascination, and intuition. And so we have to start learning this process. And the first thing we need to do is let go of what was and start to begin the process of upskilling us in what's going to be. So that's the first cycle that I wanted to take you through. The second cycle is a book called The Fourth Turning, an incredible book that really blew my mind when I was reading it. And really what this book shows us is that we are in constant cycles as human beings. Now, the guys who wrote this book are William Strauss and Neil Howe, and they came up with the idea uh, of generational archetypes. The baby boomers, the Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z, these were the two guys that came up with it. And we all now use these terms like they've been around with us forever, but really they were the guys who came up with it. But in the 90s, they did further research and they came out with a book called The Fourth Turning. And in it, what they explain is that humanity is going through something called the saculum, which is about an 80 year to 100 year cycle without us even knowing about it. And they've tracked these bubbles of cycles all the way back for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they've shown that inside each one of these cycles, we have four mini cycles. And these four mini cycles are almost like our seasons. You know, the high is the spring, the awakening is the summer, the unraveling is the autumn, and the crisis is the winter. The last time your cycle ended was 1946 with World War II ending that whole world. And then we began with the first turning or the high or spring from 1946 to 1964. And we had all this level of newness that was happening around us. But let me take you through all of these cycles and seasons. And I'll show you that we very much bang on the money where we are right now with the implosion and crisis that we have around us. And I want you to keep one thing in mind. These two gentlemen didn't predict anything. All they said was they said and showed us in the book that all the things that had happened in the last fourth turning, the last crisis, and it's pretty much exactly what's going on in this fourth turning or, law or crisis. So let's get stuck in to the first one. The first turning was all about peaceful living. The world had just come out of war. We didn't want any more war. We just wanted to have a state of newness and renaissance. And over this period of time, boy, did we have a lot of new things happen for us as human beings. We had the space program being introduced to us, which gave us this new incredible potential for what we were able to do. Also, the United Nations was formed to bring about this level of peaceful living. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, was set up to try and bring about stability in the world economy economies and also over this period of time jets were introduced to the world it's like this new way to transport ourselves as well as tvs were introduced over this period of time so the first turning the sort of plus minus uh, at 20 years or so was really about newness peaceful living and this new idea of renaissance the high as they call it but every spring is followed by summer and now in summer what we have is an awakening and in this awakening, it's really, as human beings, we awaken to more of our potential, the potential of our universe, the potential of new communication streams. And in this process, we know that, you know, there was many, many Woodstocks over this period of time. This one was the most famous one, but we all laughed at the sort of psychedelic revolution that was created over this period of time. But if you look at all the research today, psychedelics are now used 
for PTSD, for depression, for a whole bunch of things that actually moves us to awakening to more of ourselves. And so this really began at this time, this awakening over this period of time from 1964 to 1984. Also, this period of time saw the introduction of computers to the world, a brand new awakening to new forms of communication and new potentiality for us to really expand the way we work, bringing about incredible levels of efficiency and speed in what we did. And my favorite one, Star Wars, was introduced over this period of time. And the reason I put this in here is because Star Wars expanded our potential of human beings. You know, I remember watching it when I was a child and I was just blown away at the incredible imagination that was brought to the screen. And it really expanded the potential of what I thought the universe was about. And awakening to more of ourselves was very much the second turning. But every summer is followed by autumn. And autumn is all about the unraveling. And the unraveling is where we almost get sort of the structures that we once trusted start to decay, start to unravel, just like autumn is all about. And over this period of time from 1984 to 2008, we had the Berlin Wall, the unraveling of the sort of communism capitalism play that was playing out. We had the unraveling of the Chinese sort of doctrination where Tiananmen Square really started to wake up China to become the giant it is today. Obviously, now they're moving back to some socialist nationalist sort of space where they're prioritizing country over economic economies. But Tiananmen Square really happened over this period of time where we had this unraveling in China. We also had the Exxon Valdez happen over this time where we started to question the sort of idea of business at the cost of anything. And this process really hurt nature in many, many ways. And it unraveled the idea and started to ask the question is, is it worth it just for the sake of money to have so much harm? And the positive of this is that we obviously started the green movement from this process. You know, this whole idea now with solars and electric cars and all these sort of things was really catalyzed very much by Exxon Valdez over this period of time. And also what we had was 9-11 over this period of time where we unraveled the idea of conspiracy theories, wars, terrorism, and all these sort of things really in front of all of us. It unraveled this level of security that we almost had a falsehood around. But every autumn is followed by winter. And like I said, these two gentlemen, William Strauss and Neil Howe, did not make any predictions. They just told us in the book what had happened in the previous sort of fourth turning. And financial crisis from 2008 was the beginning and the catalyst for this crisis to begin. And I remember studying at school. I remember there was a picture of a kid carrying a wheelbarrow of money in World War II to go and buy bread, and they couldn't afford bread. This was in Germany somewhere, where the financial crisis had created a massive levels of depreciating value for money. And here we are again with the same sort of scenario happening. They also spoke about political divide and nationalism, and this is what Mussolini did in Italy, Hitler did in Germany, and now we have it Brexit, we have Italy again into fascism, we have Greece going into that space, we have the American sort of country also imploding around this idea of nationalism and political divide. And look, this is normal, because why, when there's so much change, people who are fearful want to hold on to the past, they don't want to create, evolve, so they become nationalists. And this is a ridiculous notion, it's really only fueled by fear more than anything else. They also spoke out of a massive war that would happen. And I think that, and I'm hoping there won't be a real war, real, real war, but COVID-19 was very much a war. We are still fighting, you know, 5 million people dead, invisible enemy. And it really was quite a chaotic process for us uh, as human beings over this period of time. And so it really was a type of war that none of us really expected. And lastly, they spoke very much about job losses and about this idea that because of technological change, because of the financial crises, there will be a lot of job losses. And today we have the compounded effect of AI and machine learning that's creating even more sort of need for us to retrain ourselves while so many jobs start getting taken away from us. And so this is the second cycle that I wanted to show you. And in this second cycle, I think what's most important is for us to realize that we really and truly have a crisis of meaning on our hands where everything we once trusted implicitly we don't trust anymore. And if you think about it, the political system, I mean, 20 years ago when the news came on, we thought the prime minister was speaking the gospel, but really we all know now that it's just smoke and mirrors is the nicest way I can call it. We know that education doesn't guarantee us anymore like it's something like it used to. Fastest growing religion in the world is no religion. Uh, the, the construct of marriage is not even happening and there's so many more divorces. And I can just keep going. It's just everything that once meant something to us doesn't mean anything to us. And we are all in this collective trauma 
where we are in this incredible level of lack of meaning. And so we have to now realize and accept that we still have a few more years of this to go. And when we start to see more things implode, we shouldn't celebrate it, but we should be accepting of it. And we should be okay with the fact that we need to seek discomfort within ourselves to evolve our brains, moving away from logical thinking to more intuition, to more fascination as we move into this new world. Now, when we're given so much unknowns, we get triggered. And in this process, I call this process the survivor consciousness trigger points, is that every single one of us are triggered very differently. And when we are given so much change on mass, the whole world seems to be triggered. But individually, we have a very, very powerful opportunity to look at the way we perceive change and look at the way of what's triggering us and why it's triggering us. And if we can heal those triggers through that process of self-reflection, we're able to then to evolve quicker. Because all of the triggers, as I'll show you now, are really just identities that we don't want to let go of. And that's the real problem here is that just like the Luddites didn't want to let go of being farmers, we also now are finding many Luddites around the world who don't want to let go of remedial jobs, even normal jobs that are being taken away by AI and machine learning. People are upset about it. In fact, we shouldn't be upset. We should just be evolving. But if we are able to understand the two ways we can perceive the world, we can become more self-reflective so that we can heal the parts of ourselves that are holding us back. So there's two perspectives that we can see the world in. The first one's called the naive mindset or the drama triangle. And the second one is called the mature mindset or the creator triangle. And so let's go through the first one. The first way that we can see the world, which is a naive mindset, is made up of three characteristics. The first characteristic is the victim. Poor me. I can't believe this is happening to me. I studied so hard for this. I worked so hard for this. Now it's getting taken away from me. It's because I'm a man. It's because I'm a woman. It's because I'm tall. It's because I'm short. You can pretty much use any excuse you want to get yourself to feel sorry for yourself. And this really doesn't help anybody because it's not happening to you, it's happening to everybody. So it's really just, it's a mass situation that's happening. The second characteristic that we see in people that are stuck in this naive mindset or the drama triangle, as it's called, are people that are stuck with sympathy. They sit on their couches and they're sad for the world, but really not doing anything to help them. And let's be very clear that sympathy and empathy are vastly different. And we see, for example, Oprah is empathetic to improving women's lives. So she builds schools and she uplifts women. She doesn't feel sorry for them. She's uplifting them. That's sympathy versus empathy. And the person that's stuck in the drama triangle is sitting on their couch, feeling sorry for the world, thinking that because they're feeling sorry for the world, they're doing their job in helping the world. But in fact, it's just keeping you stuck to an old identity. And the last characteristic is the angry person, a person that's always looking for something to be angry about. If it's not the government, it's the dollar rand exchange, it's the crypto, it's those Muppets, it's that idiot. And they're almost looking for any way to find offense in anything that's said around them. We all know somebody like this. In fact, maybe some of you might be like this, but I definitely know some people like this that just find any reason to be offended and find any reason to find to become angry. God forbid you tell any of these people that they're suffering from a victim mindset. <laughs> They'll have even more to be angry about. But let's become very clear is that if we are stuck in this naive consciousness and none of these feelings will help us evolve into where we're going. They almost are old behaviors that are keeping us stuck in this past. And look, with so much change, it's easy to fall into the trap of feeling sorry for ourselves, sad for the world, or angry with the world. And just on a big caveat, quick caveat, when we watch the news, guess what we come away with? We either feeling angry with somebody, sorry for somebody, or sorry for ourselves. So the news channels are 100% into the drama triangle because they sell us drama, and then we get addicted to drama, and we love being in that drama. But let's get into the mature mindset and we realize that, look, there's a different way that we can perceive the world. And this is the way that we need to adopt in order to be able to evolve into what's coming. Instead of a victim, we can be a creator. Instead of seeing problems, we see opportunities. And this is really obviously indicative of entrepreneurs in many ways, you know, and what's an entrepreneur? It's not really somebody who owns a business only. It's somebody who likes to solve problems and then as a gift, likes to solve even bigger problems. And so this creator mindset is something that we need to accept, adopt, and actually become aware of so that we can start to look for opportunities rather than feeling sorry for the world. We can move from savior to coach. We don't have to feel sorry for anybody. We can be empathetic and we can coach people around us and even ourselves to lift up 
and to be able to deal with this level of uncertainty. And finally, we move from anger to challenger, where we're able to challenge ourselves, challenge our colleagues, challenge our family to really step up and embrace this change in many different ways. Remember, the reason I started off with the two cycles is that everything's a cycle. We're not here forever. And so we have to become okay with the fact that it's in this time where we seek to become challengers, coaches, and creators that will put us 10 steps ahead of everybody else as we start to become uh, sort of moving towards the first turning or the next high or renaissance that we're moving towards. But let's go back to business because I think it's important that we land this uh, for business because that's really what we're all doing here is trying to understand how this affects us personally, obviously, but also how does it affect our businesses? And because we have exponentially faster changing futures, because so much technology is converging and this convergence is just creating this incredible pace of change, in fact, faster than ever, ever experienced towards a more unknown future than ever, ever experienced. And so we have to realize that the very fundamentals of business are up for question. And the way we've always done things is called the complicated way. And the way we need to start doing things is the complex way. You see, the world we come from is complicated. But the world we're moving into is complex and there's fundamental differences in these two sort of ideas around business. But let's start off with complicated and understand what complicated is about. The complicated world has patterns that repeat themselves. And because they've got patterns that repeat themselves, just like a factory line, just like the Industrial Revolution was always about A, B, C, D, E. It's always a linear process. In this process of patterns that repeat themselves, we work with mathematics, accounting, and Excel spreadsheets to devise the future in a linear manner because it looks like the past with some minor deviations and bada bang, bada bing. You got yourself a five-year plan. All good because for hundreds of years, this has done exceptionally well for us. Also, in the space of complications, everything eventually becomes automated. Because remember, what's automation? It's pattern recognition that's picked up by AI and data. And this pattern recognition gets repeated over and over and gets smarter and smarter in this linear fashion. And so what happens is that everything that's inside a complicated world eventually becomes automated, which means that if we are working in a complicated world, the commoditization of our services and products are happening because machinery are becoming more and more and more involved in this world of complications. But here is the crux of this system, is that in this world, the complicated world, the foundation of this model is the economies of scale. And in this process of economies of scale is efficiency, obviously, because what you want to do is you're doing what you did last year. You just want to do it cheaper and make more profits because the world hasn't changed much. And so that's how we keep that machine, that factory line going, because it's how we continuously make money. This has worked for hundreds of years, very, very successfully. People have made incredible amounts of money from this and has created incredible innovations around the world. But here we go into a new world of complexity. And in this new world of complexity, here are some foundational differences. In this world of complexity, we have some patterns, but they don't repeat themselves. And that's the crux here. And so what we're trying to do is we're still trying to use mathematics, Excel spreadsheets, and accounting to figure out what the future looks like. But we can't because it's not a pattern repeating process. This is a totally juxtaposition process. That's why intuition works here, not logical left brain thinking. Also, no technology has been invented as yet, and I don't see it for a while, to come that will deal with complexity because machine learning and data is very good at linear process driven, but not complex where it's always changing and patterns aren't there. But here's the foundational difference here is that in this world of complexity, economies of scale is in fact a very dangerous process to drive in the future because you're betting on one horse. Whereas this new world requires economies of learning and robustness instead of efficiency. So what does this mean? Economies of learning is another way of saying agile. And what is agile? How quickly can you unlearn to relearn? And robustness is the exact opposite of efficiency, which means I need to spread my wings as far and wide as possible, create as many different products and services to see what the market actually takes on. Now, we know that, for example, a brand like Sheen, I don't know if you know this clothing brand from China, they don't carry any stock. They market shirts, T-shirts, whatever it is, and whatever starts getting sold, they start making more of. They've almost got a reverse way of doing it. And so when we think about economies of learning and robustness, we can't think about existing businesses trying to adopt this. We almost create new businesses that work backwards without the need for efficiencies and economies of scale, but actually learning on the go and creating robust expressions of all the products to see what actually 
holds in the marketplace. But let me land this for you with an example. Remember when we used to go to the airport a lot? Well, I'm in Dubai now, so I have been at the airport quite a lot. But when you used to go to the airport a lot and we used to put our suitcase on the conveyor belt before we actually boarded the flight, that conveyor belt was a complicated world. In other words, it was pattern repeating, process driven, highly automated, hardly any people involved into it. And because of this pattern repetition, you'll see this video. It's just hardly any people with thousands of suitcases that by some wonderful miracle arrive on, a, on the plane with us 99% uh, of the time. The world we come from is a conveyor belt. The world we're moving into, however, is a complex one. And best description of this is when the plane takes off and is in the air, now we have no idea what's going to happen. We don't know if a bird is going to fly into the engine, a pilot's going to die, as operating system's going to go down. We just have no idea. So what do we do? We're robust in the way we build planes. In other words, we have four engines when one is enough. We have three pilots when one is enough. We have 25 operating systems backing each other up when really one is enough. But because we have no idea what's going to happen up there and we've got the safety of people to look after, what we do is we over-prepare. And in the process of over-preparing, we're not really building about efficiencies. We're building about robustness. And the machines on the plane are constantly unlearning to relearn what the next step is so that we can come out of it in the safest way possible. Now, the world we come from is a conveyor belt. The world we're going into is a plane that's up in the sky with no certainty of what's going to happen. And so what this makes us think about is the world we come from is about just in time. And this is what Toyota created back in the 80s about hyper efficiency and creating just in time solutions. And the world we're moving into is almost exactly the opposite. It's just in case because we have no idea what's going to be coming. And like I said, we can't think of this in the traditional way. We almost have to think of business in a roundabout Z to A rather than A to Z way. Now, the problem is, is that the world that we're in right now is ruled and run by experts. Experts of yesterday. And that's the biggest problem that we're having is that Herman Kahn, one of the best futurists that I ever had the pleasure of, meeting, he spoke very much about this idea that the expert problem is what's holding the world back. And so what he says is the more expert, or at least the more educated a person is, the less likely that person is to see a solution when it is not within the framework in which he or she has been taught to think. And this is the problem is that Many of the countries around the world and many organizations around the world are run by people that are incredibly efficient and highly intelligent in a complicated world. And now all of a sudden the rules have changed and now we are in a complex world where the foundations of business are shifting. And this is what's creating so much panic in the world because things aren't fitting like they used to. Costs are far too high and we're trying to still cut costs but still on old business models. So what we need to think about is this very big difference between today and tomorrow, very big difference between innovation and disruption. And so if you think about innovation and disruption, you need to think about them as foundationally different. I need to think about them as today and tomorrow processes so that we can prepare both for tomorrow as well as keep today alive. And so I'm not saying we should throw away economies of scale by no means, but what I'm saying is that we need to be preparing for economies of learning while we keep the economies of world, economies of scale alive for as long as they're relevant, but in the meantime, building parallel businesses next door. So let's just really recap what innovation is. Innovation is doing what you did last year just a bit better, doing old things better, doing what you've always done just more modified and more efficiently. And that's really, for me, the idea of innovation. It's about bringing in efficiencies. It's about bringing streamlined processes to our businesses. And that's all good and it's necessary, but it could be a very dangerous place because what we start to do is we think that because we're being innovative, it's more than enough. But actually, it could be a very dangerous place to be stuck because disruption is creating new business models that make the old ones obsolete. And this is a very different idea than innovation. And so when organizations tell their clients or their staff that you must be both innovative and disruptive, you are doing the worst thing you could for your staff because what you're doing is you're making them schizophrenic. What they're trying to do is they're always doing what they did last year, creating more efficiencies, as well as making their current business model obsolete. In fact, I don't think anybody internally is making their current business models obsolete to create new ones because they would be pushing themselves out of a job. And that's almost like goes counter to our own survival sort of ideas within ourselves. So, but I have solutions for this and I'll be ending off with these solutions. But let's talk about a brand that got caught up in an innovation loop, a loop that they thought they were doing the best they could, but in fact, got them into a lot of trouble. We all know Gillette. They went from one blade to two blade, 
to three blade, to four blade, to five blade, to six blade. Did anybody ask for all these bloody blades? I definitely didn't. And nobody else did because not only for the love of, or the growing love of beards, but for the old business models and for them outpricing themselves out the market in 2019, Procter & Gamble shaved off $8 billion off the Gillette balance sheet. Why? Do you know where those Gillette blades are today in pharmacies and in grocery stores? They locked away because they get stolen because they're so flippin' expensive. And what they did was they didn't do anything wrong. They just thought, you know, we want to make it a better product, but they outpriced themselves. They they were still following the supply and demand business model, which was just became far too expensive and really hurt Procter & Gamble in many ways. At the very same time as Procter & Gamble losing $8 billion, this business called the $1 Shave Club with a subscription model of $1 a month sent you a brand new fresh blade once a month. Imagine, remember how many blades? One, not six. And this was good enough and gave us a good enough shave. And we had a very quirky brand that we could follow. And this business got sold to Unilever, Procter & Gamble's competition at the very same time with a brand new business model. And it really gets us to think that we can't just focus on efficiencies because the light bulb wasn't invented because we made the candlestick more efficient. We had to totally rethink the idea of light inside homes and businesses. So we mustn't throw away the candle, but we must also start to think what the next sort of lighting structure would be like the light bulb. So let's give you an example of disruption. And the best example that I have seen in recent years is this idea of Japan Airlines getting into the future of travel. And they realized that if they had to ask their current teams to think about the future of travel, they would talk more about planes, airlines, I mean, planes and airlines, same thing, planes, uh, airports, uh, better meals, I don't know, better service, those sort of things, which is innovation, not disruption. And so what they did was they launched a $70 million collaboration fund and they got peter diamandis from um, from uh, singularity university to run this x prize and what they did was they funded and partnered with a startup in japan called limitless travel and what limitless travel did was just mind-blowing and kudos to japan airlines for investing in such an incredible futuristic idea about travel so what do they do they created these avatar systems. Let me read this with you and then I'll explain it to you. Focusing on the development of an avatar system that will transport a human sense, actions, and presence to a remote location in real time, leading to a more connected world. So what does this mean? Let's say my grandmother lives in Sydney and I live in Cape Town. And my grandmother is not that well. She's bedridden at the moment. But my grandmother has never seen Champs-Élysées in Paris. And so what we do is we hire two avatars or sort of humanoid robots that are in Champs-Élysées. My grandmother puts goggles on. I put the goggles on or VR headsets. We put the suit on, this haptic suit that gives us a sense of heat, cold, touch, whatever the case may be. And my grandmother and I overrun these two humanoid robots or avatars in Champs-Élysées. And for one hour, we walk down Champs-Élysées, seeing, hearing, and feeling everything these robots feel because that's the new technology that will give us limitless travel that we never have to even get onto a plane. And once that hour is done, my grandmother and I are having such a fantastic time. Very sad that we haven't tasted the croissants in Paris because that technology is not quite here yet. Or smelt the beautiful perfumes in Paris. If you haven't been there and smelt those perfumes, you're missing out. And so those technologies are still coming. But my grand says, you know what, darling? I haven't been to Toronto. I really want to go and see New York in Canada, which is what Toronto is. And so we decide to take on two new avatars and humanoid robots in, in Toronto, and we overtake their bodies and we start spending another hour in Toronto. Now, this is the idea of disruption. This is because it's making a current business model obsolete to create a new one. While innovation is still necessary, we need to be thinking about what the future of travel could look like. And this was all brought about by the stretchable sensor skin that gives robots and virtual reality users the exact same sense of touch. And you can see that really what we need to start jiggling with and start to understand is that our brains need to start evolving to a place where we look for these challenges and we look to bring about sort of uncomfortability inside our brain so that we can start to evolve faster. I'm going to start winding down the talk now, but before I do, I want to take you through the Stanford University research that they did around growth mindset. Now, growth mindset is a very famous book. It's maybe 10 years old now. And uh, Carol Dweck wrote it and uh, Satya Nadal from... Uh, 
Microsoft got everybody to read it uh, when he arrived at Microsoft for one very clear reason. He wanted to make a know-it-all culture, a learning culture. And so growth mindset is exactly that. It explains how we need to understand our neuroscience to become quite comfortable with the growth of challenges and newness. And so what they talk about is this idea of dopamine. And we have two very clear ways to get dopamine. We have an intrinsic way to get dopamine. We have an extrinsic way of getting dopamine. And so intrinsic is internally created. Extrinsic is waiting for money or a gift or a kudos from somebody on the outside. Now, what they did in their research is they realized that as a society, we are suffering from something called the dopamine reward prediction error. And this is a huge problem because what this this error is all about is an addiction to certainty. And let me explain it to you. If you have a child and your child is writing an exam next week, what you say to your child is, look, son uh, or daughter, um, well done that you're studying so much and good luck for your exam next week. And when you get your A, we'll go out for an ice cream. What that shows is that we're not celebrating and, and giving ourselves any dopamine or any serotonin or any of these sort of uh, molecules inside our head throughout the process of challenge. We're only celebrating it right at the end and only if we get an A. And what this has done is stopped our brains from secreting dopamine, enjoying challenge and only ever doing things for outcomes. And this is the problem that we're having as a society is that we need to be celebrating challenge, especially when we have so much uncertainty ahead of us, especially when we have this unknown future happening. We need to be celebrating the issues that we're having right now and the challenge that we're going through it. And when we do, dopamine is secreted inside our heads, which gives us more energy, which gives us more collaborative, creative energy that we can do more with. So they did a couple experiments in the book, and I'll share two of them with you. The first one were these 10-year-old kids that loved doing art. And they were doing art because of the intrinsic um, effect that it was having on them and the dopamine that was being released inside their heads. And they kept doing art, and they were measuring the dopamine inside their heads. And then the teachers started giving them gold stars for doing the art. And what started to happen is the kids started to switch from an intrinsic to an extrinsic way to access dopamine. And they still enjoyed doing art, but it wasn't so much about the art now, it was about the outcome, this addiction to certainty, this addiction to an outcome and a kudos from the outside. And when the teachers stopped giving them gold stars, they stopped liking doing art. And this is the thing, is that we can switch from internal to extrinsic, or we can switch from extrinsic to internal. We can do it, and we can and should in this process of challenge. And the second example is the Navy SEALs. And they interviewed the guys who made it through the Navy SEALs. And the guys who made it are the ones who celebrated the process and the effort and the challenge. The guys who didn't make it were the guys who were waiting till it ended before they gave themselves the gift of dopamine. And we all know when we give ourselves this intrinsic hit of dopamine, we have this amazing access to energy, creativity, joy, which is all about more and collaboration. So we must realize that many people have written about this. Nassim Taleb wrote a book called Anti-Fragile, which is pretty much exactly the same scenario here, where he says, if you're fragile and you drop, you break. If you're anti-fragile and you drop, you get stronger. And it's about dropping to get stronger, which is really what this future requires of us to switch our neuroscience. And so we often think about this term of resilience and how important it is for us to be resilient. But to be honest with you, I think resilience is quite an evolution trap. It doesn't get us to think into imagination because resilience, just like transformation, has three sections. It has respond, which is important because we obviously need to respond to the world or to crises or whatever the case may be. And then we have to recover. And that's kind of where most of us stop. We respond and recover in resilience. And then we're like, okay. We've done what we need to do. We've gotten ourselves back to where we were, thank goodness. And we often don't put in the extra effort to reimagine what needs to be coming. So be careful not to be caught up in the resilience trap and just responding and recovering rather than spending more time on reimagining. Now, in order for us to conquer uncertainty within our organizational structures, what I have seen as best practices around the world is teams that are focused on today and teams that are focused on tomorrow. Because the rules are both vastly different, we need people that are focused on innovation, and we need people that are focused on disruption. So 
The Today team, which is pretty much every business in the world, is focused on the one to two year horizons. They're all about economies of scale, all about profitability, all about old business models. They're experts of yesterday, and these are the innovators. And I don't mean to be rude in any way, but experts of yesterday means they've got the skills that were necessary in the previous world. And many of us have been very good in this. And slowly but surely, we're starting to get more people that are going to be better in this world. But innovators are necessary to keep the world alive while we feed and fund what the next world needs to look like. And then you have the tomorrow team. And these people are working on a two to five year horizon. They're all about economies of learning, experimentation, new business models. And these people are really the experts of tomorrow. And I call these people the disruptors. And if we're able to adopt this idea of today and tomorrow teams, understand the neuroscience inside our heads and realize that we have a choice of coming to the world through drama or through creator, understanding that the cycles are happening, whether we know them or not. And if we can understand these cycles, we can become clearer in the fact that we are in still a process of transformation before the Renaissance comes in around 2028 or so. And this gets us to both respond and recover to the world around us, as well as reimagine the world that we're moving towards. And every successful person I have ever met always starts off with two beliefs. The future will be better than the past, and I definitely have the power to make it so. To be making sure that we have this power to make it so, we need to wire ourselves for the solution. Not uh, We need to wire ourselves for the puzzle, not the solution, and ultimately try and seek discomfort as often as possible. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm open and here for any questions that you may have. Over to you. Well, John, uh, some great insights there. I really like that, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the better, better future lies ahead. It's a, a great positivity coming out of the message tonight and some great um, stories in terms of looking back and uh, almost like a history lesson of, you know, re recapping the mind and everything. So yeah, really appreciate that. That was awesome. In terms of some I questions, we've got we've got a few that are mm. coming in there, John. Um, and yeah, please do post some questions in, in the comments there, anyone who's in the audience. Um, I suppose, you know, you've touched on a few points there, John. One, one of the questions that I have is, you know, as a company who places a massive emphasis on our people and culture and learning and development, how do we future proof um, our company culture? Well, I think it's an evolving process. And I think for you to be agile in the process that you create this culture is key. I was watching an interview with Satya Nadal and he was talking about the future of work. And he said, you know, we've given teams the autonomy to develop what their teams require. There's no rules. Yeah. We need to be adaptable in this process because if somebody's gotten used to picking up their kid at three o'clock, who are we to now come and tell you that you have to be in the office from nine to five, which is almost archaic in a way, right? Mm. So I think it's about adaptability. And I don't think there's any steadfast rules of what should be done or not done besides being adaptable and being humanistic and empathetic towards people and allowing them to actually add value when they feel best to add value with small stints of coming together in groups and then moving out. And again, this is necessary and not necessary for depending on teams and jobs. And really yeah. the key for me and the best cultures I've seen are adaptable in many ways to people's needs. No, excellent. Spot on. Um, I'll just take a few questions at the start there. Um, so, John, one at the top there from uh, said, um, brilliant insights, John. Do you have any thoughts on cryptocurrency as the future of money? Yes, I do. I'm uh, quite deep in myself in cryptocurrencies at this moment. What I want to say is I want you to think about cryptocurrencies like cars. And let me explain why. At the turn of the 19th century, what we had was the introduction of cars. And for the first 20 years, we were very much used to horses. And cars were almost an irritation. There weren't enough petrol stations around. Cars were slow and chugging along. They uh, were expensive. There wasn't the road structure that would actually adhere to these cars working. And so people were kind of irritated with them. But it took 20 years for the great inversion to happen. And when 20 years passed, all of a sudden, there were enough petrol stations, there was enough roads, and there were enough uh, space and new roads being built that both the horses and the cars to now travel quite comfortably in. So do I think cryptocurrency is the future? I think it's part of the future. Do I think fiat money is going away? I don't know. The, the experts of that world are right here. Uh, I'm not the expert there. But I think there will be a dual 
carriage that will be happening between fiat and crypto and allowing that to merge in some way or not. But I also heard something fantastic the other day. It said, um, the old rich people are holding on to their money so tight that we're going to create our own economy so we can create, become rich ourselves as well. And if you think about it, uh, there was a talk uh, at Miami in Miami to some bankers and the guy from cryptocurrency asked anybody in the audience to put their hands up of who's bought crypto. And many, very few bankers put their hands up, but every single waiting staff, barman, AV <laughs> and security put their hand up that have bought Bitcoin. So I think it's a new way for people to express themselves, have some freedom, be decentralized in the way they have money. So it's definitely part of the future. I don't know if we'll replace fiat though. Yeah, ah, great answer. Question there from Nadine uh, Upton. Nadine, thanks for your question. Letting go of the idea of a perceived entitlement to uh, certainty can evoke a certain amount of fear. Any words on how to get through those fears, John? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think this idea of not having certainty is very, very fearful. But the truth is today we don't have any certainty. So we almost don't have a choice. So if we're going to sit looking for certainty and we're addicted to the level of certainty, we're not celebrating our challenges, then we are only to blame ourselves for being miserable, unhappy, frustrated, angry. And that's why I spoke about the drama triangle is for us to really become quite clear. Where are we stuck in drama? Where are we working on maturity and letting go of the process of needing logical left brain certainty to move more into a space of fascination, curiosity, excitement, and intuition. Now, this is not an easy process. I'm not saying you should snap your fingers, but understand that this is the new skill. The economies of learning is the new power that we will have. It's not about studying and then following the same thing for the rest of your career. And I think today they're talking about the Gen Z's having 29 careers in their lives, an average of 29 careers, wow. whereas our dads and moms had one career. So yeah. imagine that process. So it's a change. And we also have to adapt and adopt and get away from logical process driven to more adaptability and more agility. Yeah, and I suppose off the back of that, another question from V. Ray Smith. Uh, John, dealing with, with crisis, do you believe in acting immediately or waiting for the crisis to almost subside and then uh, mop up, so to say? Sorry, when I read that again, when dealing with crises, do you believe in acting immediately or waiting for the crisis to almost subside when the mop up to stay? Look, Aviva, it's a very broad question. It depends on what crisis. I don't know. Like you have family crises, business crises. Mm. Some need breathing space. Some need to be plugged so that people don't die from blood <laughs> loss. So I, I don't know. I think it's too broad a question. I think each one requires our own uh, maturity and our own intelligence and intuition to figure out what needs to be responded and recovered to and what can breathe a little bit. But for me, you know, when we can get out of the drama and we can have a bigger viewpoint or a broader viewpoint of the, of the situation, it obviously always gives us better opportunity to make decisions that are not emotional, that are not caught in drama or naivety, but much more in maturity and creator. Yeah, and um, we have a question there from our research uh, manager at Monocle, Guy Walding. Uh, regarding the need to let go as AI disrupts the, the working world, what are your thoughts on the universal income? Could developing countries like South Africa implement this in the future, John? Yeah, Guy, it's a great question, but I often think that we think about this universal basic income in, in, in the terms that we're living in today. And I think that we need to think about the future and realize that we're moving into a society called the Zero Marginal Cost Society. This is a, a great book by Jeremy Rifkin, a global economist that advises China, Germany, and the EU on the third industrial revolution. I highly recommend you look up his documentary that he did in partnership with Vice on YouTube. And what he talks about is that digitization and technology takes away the cost of pretty much everything in our lives. Think about music, think about photos, think about education, think about um, yeah. entertainment. All of these things have become almost nothing to access. You know, $5 a month and you got access to every song that you even, didn't even know existed through Spotify. Spot, and Netflix costs us, I don't know, I don't even know what it costs. It's so cheap. It's like 80 Rand, I think. I don't know. That we got access to so much information and, and, and TV that we, we can't even get around to watching it in 20 lifestyles, in time, lifetimes. And so what he explains in the book, in the Zero Marginal Cost Society, is that so far we've experienced free communication. And I'm saying free, almost free almost yeah. free photography and sharing of them, almost free uh, entertainment. And next is going to be energy and transportation. And this will just domino effect into every aspect of our lives. So we also have to think about the idea of decentralized organizations where everybody is not a consumer, but a creator into the system. And when we start thinking about zero marginal cost society and decentralized organizations, 
basic universal income doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it, it's a different scenario where we're thinking about it in a top-down process, but in a decentralized mm. process, all of these things change. The rules change. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to come to Lyle Stevens' question next. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite detailed, so you might read this, John, but I think in the in essence of it, do you feel that those who possess the more unconventional skills of creativity, dreaming of the impossible and pushing the boundary of what may face unreal and impossible, uh, will this be the start of creating a new way of thinking um, and a new way, almost be a, a new standard of upskilling our society and systems? Lyle, you should write a book, dude. I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> what you've written here is beautiful. <laughs> Uh, Lyle, yes. uh, in, in a nutshell, yes, I think that the idea of left brain logical intelligence is quite literally being replaced right in front of our eyes. I mean, you can see lawyers work that's being replaced. You can see doctors works that are being replaced. Absolutely accounting works that are being replaced pretty much everywhere in every way. This logical process is going. So what's left is creativity, is adaptability, is this new idea of how we actually evolve into the world. And I don't think anybody actually knows what it looks like. We just have to become okay with the fact that we need to start developing a new skill. And it's in this process of learning and just being okay that we need to learn a new skill is how we learn it. Instead of trying to yeah. block it and be angry with it and be upset that it's happening, just evolve into it. And then let's figure it out together because I don't think anybody actually knows what it looks like. Yeah, great answer. I think it's ever evolving, no matter whether it's in work, within your personal yeah. life. It's, you know, looking at how you yeah. can adapt and become better at these things. You know, exactly as you said, yeah. you need to evolve with the times, John. You know, if you don't, then you're going to get stuck in that certain kind of way, you know. Exactly. Um, exactly. In terms of uh, a question here from Raisa, what is the psychology that goes into unfreezing your mindset? My, mine personally? Um, so what I decided to do was spend two hours a day walking and I, mean, I, I learn really well when I walk. And so I, I dedicated one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon. Now, look, I don't have a family. I don't have kids. Um, and so I have the luxury of time, but if we understand that we need to unlearn to relearn, the process is a day by day process so that we can expose ourselves to the unfamiliar. And so I walk in the mornings for an hour and I walk in the afternoons for an hour. And in that space, I'm both getting my 20,000 steps in as well as listening to lectures from as many different variety of teachers and thinkers, both on podcasts and on YouTube, to get this process of me just evolving my brain out. There's no silver bullet. It is a daily ritualistic process that changes your habits and your behaviors and eventually your mind. 100%. I was wondering why you're looking so young and fresh and dynamic with all those 20,000 <laughs> steps. Must be working a treat, John. But you're 100% yeah, you. right. I think, I think even during the lockdown, I said to many of my friends that, you know, I found that if I went out and ran in the morning, it was my kind of clear my head time, clear my space mm. time and figure out mm. what do I want to focus on today, you know. And you get lost mm. in that. It's similar to what you're saying in terms of walking, you know. Running is not the ideal, but you know, you're achieving a couple of things. You're planning your mind for yes. the day, setting it up for success, and also getting in some energy and getting the, the kind of the, the blood flow going as well. Yeah, um, exactly. Next question from um, Tamika. Um, you know, John, do you believe that the big brands will start um, selling virtual project, well, products in order to stay ahead of the AI initiatives? The gaming platform Roblox um, that sold a virtual Gucci bag for more than <laughs> yeah, what yeah, the yeah. actual product would cost in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, it's so funny, Tamika. I was going to use that exact example, but you've obviously read the same articles I'm reading. Nike <laughs> is now also taking in some sort of IP that they're wanting to do online. Look, the metaverse is going to be a million times bigger than our world. More will be created in there. More will evolve in there. All of us will be living half our lives, if not most of our lives, in there. We already are in a type of metaverse. It's just on our phone. Showing that phone will be in our glasses. The glasses will be inside a, a sort of lens inside our eyes. Next thing, we'll be spending some time in there. And we'll be thinking, nah. And then eventually, we'll be spending more time in there. And then it becomes this idea of inception. You know, I don't know if you remember that movie uh, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. But that movie yeah. was really, really ahead of its time. And that movie was all about a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream. And if we think about this, it's almost like we're in a reality, but we're now moving into another reality, into another reality. I imagine there'll be fourth metaverses inside that metaverse. You can actually go into another metaverse. And so I've just seen recently that Domino's Pizza has a pizza shop in some metaverses where you can order a pizza and get it delivered to your house in real life. 
So you can yeah, actually be eating a pizza that you ordered in Metaverse. So, yes, I think it's it, it, will, it will soon become so vague whether you're in or not because also the resolution of the virtual reality will become almost real. So you won't know which one you're in, which then comes down to the bigger question. Is this a VR world that we're living in already? We don't know. Yeah, look, that blew my mind when you're talking about the experience, you know, with uh, your 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 granny and stuff like that. It's just exceptional. Like, where where we're going to is very exciting, and it just goes to show yeah. you, you know, you can put your mind to it. Um, nice question coming in from Harris uh, Van der Merve, looking some insights from yourself. What are some of your favorite podcasts to listen to, John? Well, the best podcast on the podcast platform is called The Expansive. It's my podcast. Just kidding, but do listen to it. Um, <laughs> look, I listen to... I uh, listen to All In, which is fantastic. It's got Chamat. I'm a big Chamat fan. I don't know his surname. It's far too difficult for me. He's a exceptionally bright Indian gentleman. I listen to some Tim Ferriss. I listen to anything from Raul Paul, who I think is just a genius when it comes to the world of investing. Anything with Michael Saylor. Um, I listen to my friend Ran Neuner on the Crypto Banter. So I'm listening to a range of psychology, crypto, decentralized organizations, metaverse, so I, I try and get as far a range as possible. So I need to know what's going on with my consciousness, what's going on with money, what's going on with structuring of organizations, what's going on with biotech. And so it's a range. Also, Andrew Huberman. I think his name is Dr. Andrew Huberman. He's also the Huberman podcast. Unbelievable. He's also a Stanford University a neuroscience lecturer. I, I highly recommend him as well. Yeah, oh, cool. And and on the flip side, what are you reading? You're like you're you're obviously still writing books and you know. You talk about so much there. What, what's kind of grabbing your attention at the moment, reading-wise? It's funny. I've stopped reading, uh, Patrick. I Have you? Now just yeah. podcast. Yeah. I just, so straight into While it. I'm walking, yeah, while I'm walking, because I've realized I'm a much better learner while I'm moving. And sitting down, it doesn't work for me personally. You know, I write books, but uh, I'm listening to podcasts and listening to YouTube lectures more than anything else. But that's just me. Other people love reading books and anything by the geniuses out there like the Yuval Hararis and those sort of people. I mean, you can never get enough of that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, question there from Nampa Malelo. Um, so embracing complexity requires focusing on the now and not the future awards um, in order to grow brain capacity. Maybe you might just focus on that a little bit, John, for us. So embracing complexity requires focusing on the now and not future rewards at the mental level in order to grow brain capacity. Um, look, um, I don't understand the question, to be honest. See, embracing complexity requires focusing on the now and not future rewards. Yes, okay, I get that point. But yeah. look, embracing complexity requires us to be your yeah, level in order to grow brain. It's not, um, yeah, I, I think the, the question is a bit confusing. For me, it's about being so fascinated with your topic that it doesn't matter the outcome. The fascination with the topic is the gift. When you're so, you know, the best thing to, to use as an example, when you're doing something that makes you lose time, you don't care about the outcome. You're just so enthralled in what you're doing right now, the outcome kind of takes care of itself. And so yeah. this is the difference between logical outcome based and having the idea around uh, intuition. It's about just sinking into the now so that the outcome becomes irrelevant. The outcome is sinking into the now. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, I think that's that's it in terms of time. We're over time. Um, John, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Monica webinar tonight. I uh, really Thank do you. appreciate your time. Um, it's been very insightful. I've really enjoyed it. It's something different that we've had. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to looking at many more of your videos and uh, insights and waiting, waiting for the Thank next you. book to come out. So great. Thank um, just so for much, everyone. And, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just for everyone no, just else, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the delay there. So, just for everyone else who's on the line, and um, thank you for attending this Forge Your Future webinar. And um, other Monocle events that are happening tonight, and the End of Money book launch, a book written by our CEO David, and our exceptional writing team of Robin and Chris, and they'll be at exclusive books at the V&A Waterfront in Cape Town tonight. If you haven't already um, purchased the book, please go out get yourself a copy of it. Make a great Christmas present also, you know. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this. Look out for, you know, more of the Monaco webinars that we'll be hosting in the beginning of 2022. And John, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Wish you all the best. Safe traveling in Dubai. Look after yourself and thank you. have a great evening, folks. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao.